Um, and we are continuing our conversation about education finance with Brad James and Julia, Brad James from the Agency of Education and Julia Richter um, from the Joint Fiscal Office. We left off in the middle of a presentation from Mr. James. Um, so please come on down. Um, and I'm very cognizant of your time, both your time and Ms. Richter's time. Um, so we're getting you out no later than two minutes before two o'clock. I, I, I told House that I'd probably be a little bit late. It's fine. Yeah, yeah so well, let's don't let you. Really on the other hand. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll turn this over to you, Mr. James. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, for the record, Brad James, Agency of Education. Hopefully picking up where I left off yesterday. Of course, I didn't bring that with me, actually, but that's okay. Uh, no, it's not. Um, so yesterday, we were kind of going over the simplistic version of how weights work and how they tend to interact with one another. Okay. And I think the point we ended at is... Um, Right where I was saying these are the new weights that it's going to have that are going to be occurring in S287 if it was to go through. Yes. But recommended by the task force. Yes. Okay. And so you can, again, just to reiterate what I said yesterday, um, the weights that we're currently using are, are for pre K, it's a reduction. It's for secondary, which are grades 7 through 12, and it's for ELL, and it's for poverty. And poverty is defined in current statute as students living with, or I shouldn't say students, <clears throat> excuse me, um, persons, children, whatever, I think this statute says persons, uh, but children living with families who are receiving economic, um, or who, <laughs> let me try this again, start over. It's, it's, it's persons ages 6 through 17 who are living with families who, re who receive nutritional benefits. It's kind of what the statute says. So what that is, that's, that's numbers from DCF, but like I think we talked about yesterday briefly. Um, and those, those are the numbers that we're currently using. So there's a weight for that. Um, the new weights, those I can't see here, the new weights expand and change the weighting amounts. So pre-K and triple E is still the same. It's, it's a reduction, it's, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's the same thing is what it is. It's a negative number here. In current statute, it's a positive. There are reasons that we don't need to worry about. It's the same result. K5 is, is, has no weight. That's kind of considered the base. K6 through eight is a, is a middle school weight now. It's a new one, and that's 0 0.36. We'll talk about what those are associated with later on. Um, and then there's a secondary weight, which instead of being 712 is now 912 because we have that middle school weight and it's 0 0.39. That's compared to the 0 0.13 that we have currently. Okay, so it's, it's three times higher. Okay. Then we have an FRL weight of 1.03. Okay, we change we changed the poverty count from, from the DCF count to students eligible for free and reduced lunches, and the weighting factor has gone up quite a bit. It, it was 0 0.25, so it's gone up by roughly a factor of four. Then, then the, the, I'm sorry. I'm just talking about, you talk about interaction right there is uh, quite a lever. It, yeah. it, it, there, there are some significant changes here. And, and again, people were thinking, this is what's gonna happen with me, but because the interaction, it's not quite what everybody expected. So now the next ones are new, the sparsities. Uh, the researchers found that, that um, in, in districts, or in, yeah, in districts with the sparsity level below a certain percent, it costs more, so they, they added weights in for that. So there are three sparsity levels. The first one is if you're if you have 30, 36 persons or less per square mile, and it's not by school. This is persons in, 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 the, in the district area. Then the weight is 0 0.15. The way the sparsities were calculated was I took I got data on populations by town, and then mapped the towns out to the school districts that they belong to, and aggregated up to that level. So that that's where that's coming from. The second one is if you have 36 or more persons per square mile, but less than 55, 
you get a, a weight of 0 0.12. And the last one is if you're 55 or more versions per square mile, but less than 100, you have a weight of 0 0.7 or 0 0.07 part. Again, these are new. Number four, or what I, I just want to inform my sheet that you'll see later, um, districts of small schools. Those were determined by the researchers to be require more if they were in a sparse district. And they, did, they said if, if, the start, if the sparsity is 55 or less, or less than 55, probably can't see my glasses there. No. Yes, less than 55 or less persons per square mile, then if you have a small school, you get this factor too. Small schools in that case were broken up into two different categories. One with enrollments below 100, you got an additional 0.21 for that. And those school, schools that had 100 to greater than 100 to 250, less than or two, equal to 250, and that's a 0.07. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Well, I may be going quickly. No, 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 you're, you're, you're fine. But we, we've had a concern as, as a state that we have too many small schools because closing schools is not an easy decision. And it sounds like by increasing the weight, maybe I'm reading this wrong, for small schools, and I, and I get it, they're more expensive to run, I get it. Um, we're kind of encouraging <laughs> I'll say we're small not schools. I mean, I, yeah. or, or putting it off because nope. we don't have to, we're gonna get more money. I, I, I don't disagree. Am I missing you. something? No, no, I don't believe you are. And, and that's kind of how current law was up until Act 46 of 2015, which was the unification bill. We were giving everybody small school grants to keep their small schools alive. Right, right. At the same time, we're saying small schools are expensive. They should be closed. They're not efficient. They're not doing such a good job. Yeah, they're plus, you know, you, you get them on all sides of that as to whether that's a true statement or not. What one of the ideas behind Act 46 was that districts would tend to merge their small schools to find more efficiencies. And in some cases, that happened. Right. In other cases, it, in most cases, it did not. Right. But the small schools grants that people got at that point, if we voluntarily merged by, by, by Act 46, became what's called a merger support grant that goes on, in, I think I said this, yes, that goes on in perpetuity until the school either closes that gave it that grant or, or the legislature changes its mind. Okay, so it, it's a mixed message. You're, you're quite right. And, and this, is, this is continuing that. And then the, the last one, the last weight is not a new one, but it's significantly different, is ELL. Currently, it's 0 0.20. It is now 2.49. Um, the, the weights came from the researchers. They were looking at what is, they're seeing every, in, you know, the, the way they did it. And these are basically what these weights were doing was saying this would be what it would take to translate dollars into a weight and say, this is what we need to bring, we need to spend extra on an average student in these categories over what a base amount would be. Okay, that, that's, that's kind of how it was done. So they're, they're resuming, and this is not the case in Vermont. We, we, don't, we don't have a foundation for it, we don't, don't have anything like that. But this assumption was that we're all spending a certain amount for the modeling that they did. And that it, these are the additional costs, quote unquote, that it would take to get to bring kids up to the right. That's, that's what these are for. Okay. All right. Now, I don't have my sheet in front of me from yesterday. I apologize. But on the next page is a calculation. Um, if, you're, if, you're looking at, if you're looking at this one from today, that's not it. This is from yesterday. That's it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, on the next one is a quick walkthrough of how tax rates are calculated. And, and Julie went over this a little bit yesterday, too. In fact, if I can't, is there one here? I might steal it for a moment. Perfect. Now I know what I'm talking about. I've, I've set Teresa. I'll put this <laughs> Thank you. So we are on page six. It's, it says tax rate calculation. Okay. 
This is just, uh, uh, again, made up numbers. This is just how tax rates are calculated. In this case, I started out, and there's a reason why I chose these numbers. In this case, because they work. In this case, I say that the total expenses for this school district are not just over $19 million. We have line two offsetting revenues of $5,210 million, $5,210,000. By offsetting revenues, I mean federal monies, categorical aid from the state in the form of special education, transportation, merger support grants, small schools grant. This may be if they're, they have tuitions coming in, it would be a tuition. It could be they have a surplus from a prior year. Um, it could be interest bearing accounts, somebody can give them money, a whole raft of things. These, these are what we mean by offsetting revenue. It's just kind of a generic term that, that I tend to use. When you subtract those two, you get what's called education spending. And there is a technical definition for education spending in, in statute. But when you subtract, we get $14,040,000 in this case. I'm sorry, what page are you on? I'm on page six. You're, 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 on, you're, on, you're, on, you're on today's. On yesterday. I'm, I'm on yesterday. So it had, it had this on the front. The words from me. Okay. I'm on page six there. So this education spending number is what goes into the education fund. That's, that's what we owe school districts plus categorical grants from the education fund. So in order to get the tax rate, we need to figure out a cost per pupil. And we talked about that initially. We divide currently by equalized pupils. And that's that weighted number that we were discussing yesterday. But this way. Today. And we're on page six. So in this case, we have 780 equalized pupils. Is everybody with me? Everybody have the right sheet of paper? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't say that clearly at the beginning. Of course, I didn't have mine either. Didn't have yours, right. <laughs> um, so we have 780 equalized pupils. When you divide education spending the $14,040,000 by 780 equalized pupils, you get line five, education spending per equalized pupil. In this case, $18,000. That's why I chose those numbers for above. Guy likes zeros. I fictitious property yield here. This is not the real property yield, but I chose $12,000 for the property yield. So for every $12,000 a district spends on its equalized, per equalized people, its tax rate is a dollar. Spend 20% more, spend your tax is 20% higher. So in this case, if you take 18,000 spending, education spending per pupil, divide by the yield of 12,000, you get $1.50. That's the tax rate, that's the equalized tax rate for the school district. At that point, the district now has a tax rate. It goes to the town that it belongs to. In this case, it's a single town. And the town then takes that tax rate, applies the com its common level appraisal and assesses it out to the taxpayers. So in this case, I cleverly chose a nice round number of 93% for the CLA. If you divide the tax rate, the equalized tax rate of $1.50 by 93%, you get a tax rate of $1.613. That's what would show up on people's tax bills, on a homestead property tax bill, that amount right there. Okay. Everybody with me? This is, this is all? Okay. Okay, again, just quick overview. So if you now turn to, to, to page seven, there's now a second set of data. Okay, the first set of data is what you just saw. The second set is has the same expenditures, same offsetting revenues, so same education spending. But we've changed the equalized people number. And this is what's gonna happen with, with S287. Is some people are going to go up, some are going to go down. So this is an example of going up. So in this case, now the equalized pupil count has gone up to 794, 780. Spending per pupil has therefore decreased. So it's now 17,683. When you divide by the yield, the, the tax rate is $1.474. That's the equalized rate. It's the property at fair market value. Divide by the CLA and the tax rate people see on their bill is $1.585. So it's down. And the only thing that changed was the pupil count. 
So that's, 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 the, that's what I want people to get to understand is that if you change your equalized pupil count, your tax rate changes. You know, so, assuming everything else is constant. In reality, it won't be constant, but. Was there a question? I, I thought so. Oh, I think we're okay. Okay, okay. So if we go to, to page eight, once again, same general idea. Same data that you saw initially on the left, different data on the right in terms of equalized pupil counts highlighted in blue. This time, the equalized pupil count went down. So this time, this school district did not have the same groupings of kids it had before in terms of the new weights. So they lost equalized pupils. Everything else stays constant. So you're now dividing the ed spending by 770 kids. Your, your spending per pupil has now gone up to $18,234. When you divide that by the yield of 12,000, you get a, a new tax rate, equalized tax rate, $1.52. So that's higher than before by, by two cents. When you do, adjust it by the CLA, you get a tax rate of people see on their bill of $1.634. So it's gone up because your pupil count has gone down. Tax rates, all else being constant, tax rates and pupil counts go in opposite directions. If one goes up, the other goes down. Yeah. Jessup, this is really great. And I'm sort of jumping ahead a little. I have two questions. Are the majority of towns going up or down? And what is the spectrum of change in terms of tax impact ranging from X to Y? It's a hard question to answer because things aren't constant. Um, I, I would, and I don't know the answer for this coming year. I've not seen CLAs yet uh, for this this coming year. My guess is they've gone down quite a bit more, more so than usual. Is my guess because because of how property values have skyrocketed. People seem to be buying a lot of property quickly at high prices. Um, so I, I I think in in general, I mean in general the yield goes up, but also spending goes up. At the same time, in general, pupil counts go down. So if your spending is going up, your pupil counts going down, your spending per pupil is going, getting higher, which is part of the reason why the yield goes up, but there's also the money coming in. But they have to bring in enough money to the Ed Fund to, to, to pay everybody. So it, I, I don't think I have an answer as to what the general is. I can look and see from a couple, for a couple of years, see what the general trend is, and I'll get back to you. I, off the top of my head, I don't know. I mean, the reason I ask is if we are going to be asked to vote on a bill and we don't have a sense of the implications, and I'm guessing that there would be some transitional plan, no doubt, but that puts us in a difficult position. That's, that's what we're going to come to afterwards. After I'm done with this, I'll talk quickly about what S-287 itself actually says. Let's show you some real examples. And then what they're talking about for a transition that's in S-287. Ways and means right now is talking about changing it all um, and, and talking about a different transition method for, for what they want to do, which Julie will speak to more than I will. Um, but so so everything is talking about some type of trans, excuse me, some type of transition mechanism. Okay. Well, uh, Rep Harris. No, I was just gonna say uh, to Kimberly's question, and I can't my hands on it. I did last night look at a chart that had all the school districts and they're, you know, at the end of four years or whatever it is. I think that's where we're going to come to. Yeah. And quickly looking, most districts ended up better off. My particular <laughs> district did not. Montpelier <laughs> did not. Um, Prattleboro does not. Prattleboro? The town. <laughs> but the district. Well, and there's yeah. some oddities of what does and doesn't end up. Right. I, I would have assumed Montpelier would not do as well, right. just given what our demographics are. But uh, Plaintail Twinfield, uh, or Tw so Twinfield, um, did not do well. And that doesn't comport I'd have, I'd have with to look. graphics. Yeah. But there's something else going on. There, there is. And, and again, and, and, and again, th there are some caveats to the, that modeling that you're talking about that I'll, that I'll come to shortly. Okay, because because they're they're serious because they're one year's worth of data. It's not really what's going to happen out here. So, so 
I'm just, that, that kind of wraps up this yes. part of yesterday, if that makes sense to everybody. Yes. Is that okay? Yes, and I'm just cognizant of time, so let's keep shouting. Sure. Okay. Then the next one I'd like to talk about is the first one that was posted today. Um, it's, it's an eight pager and it says, the first thing at the top left says weights as proposed. Oh. Th th those will come to later. Okay. okay. Let's go. But I don't have anything that says weights as proposed. Yeah, that's okay. okay. You can oh, here we go. Okay, here comes Teresa. Yeah. Well, there it is. I've got it. You got it. Okay. It's just slow. I found it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a paper blizzard today, so hang on. Yeah. Okay. This first page that we're looking at here is just simply what we talked about. These are the weights that were proposed under, under S-287 that came from the task force recommendations from the researchers. Okay, that's all that we, we talked about this. What I did add in here was I did add in blue, um, I added what the count is that we're gonna be using that weight against. So what you see under grade range weights, you see we're gonna be using the long-term ADM. <clears throat> under number two, the poverty weight we're going to be using FRL counts. Under three, sparsity population density, we're going to be using long-term ADM again. Under four, district of small schools, they have to meet two criteria to get that. They have to be in a sparse district, below 55 persons or less for populate, per square mile per population. And then they have to have a, a, a two-year average enrollment. So we'll be using the two-year average enrollment. And then English language learners, it's, it's that weight is applied against the ELL count itself. Okay, just, just so you have some background in the story, because it's, it's a key point, we're not using the same student count for the different weights. If you go to page two, I've now added in four districts and the state as a whole. And what I'm showing you are, are the counts in each of those categories that we were just talking about on page one. So we've got district A, B, C, and D, and then we have the state as a whole on the far right, columns nine and 10. These are real districts. These are, this is FY22 data. So, the, so the, these are numbers that are actually in the model, that come from the model that we're gonna be talking about. But this is, this is the starting point for the weighting for each and every district. And again, I just chose four, okay? I just didn't know if you want to take a look, all right. So if you jump over to page three, again, same data, I'm just adding, I'm filling now the weight column in. If you see the, the, the columns that are even, two, four, six, eight, and 10, are the weighting columns, the additional weights that we're adding. And I got those by taking the weight and multiplying it by whatever the appropriate student count was. So if I look at, um, if I look at uh, District A, and I'll do the first one, and it's, it's, it's pre-K, it's pre triple E, there are 125 long-term medium in those grades, or in that age range for them. Factor is negative 0.54, it's a reduction. So they lose 68 ADM. Okay, it decreases for that. But if you jump down to the middle school on 6-8, again, still District A, they have 338 kids in grades six through eight, kids long-term ADM. So you multiply that by 0.36 and the additional weight is 122. Has everybody seen how to read this? Oh. So it's, it's the same across the board here for each, for each of these sets of data. Okay. We seem to okay? Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm throwing a lot of data at you and not really going through it. But that's what I'm doing for each weight as I go down. Okay. If you jump down to number three, the sparsity weight. All right, again, there were three weights because there are three categories. I want to draw your attention to this one. District A does not meet the first criteria for sparsity, but it does meet the second criteria. So their long-term ADM is 1,497. They get the weight of 0 0.12, so that's an additional 180 for them. They, so obviously they met that one, they're not gonna meet the next one. District B does not meet any of the sparsity criteria. They're too big, they're too dense and populous. Same for District C. 
They don't meet it, anything. So they get no weight. Remember what happened to District 1 in that example from yesterday? They got no weight because they didn't meet the count criteria. Here are two examples. And then District D, <laughs> they do meet the, the second sparsity criteria of 36 or more, but less than 55. And they have 309 long-term ADM. So you multiply that by the 0.12 and you get an additional weight of 37. I think Representative Shai had a question. Oh. Sorry, Andrew. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Rep Shai. Thank you for seeing it, Brad. Um, so this is great to see this. I appreciate it. And so this says to me, once again, I just want to confirm what I think we talked about yesterday, which is that you don't you don't take the grade range eights, add the new students, and then start applying them to the other things. So you had the actual count of students in District A of 1,497, and you use that 1,497 in the population density. So you don't change, uh, you don't do other math before you get to that. They're done sort of in isolation, and then you add all the pieces together. Is that right? That's, that's exactly correct. They're, 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 they're done separately from one another, unlike current law. They're done separately from one another. And then so you get you get these individual weights for each factor that they're, they qualify for. And then at the end, we're going to add them together. Right. Perfect. Thank you. I think we would get, oh, oh, a real person, Rep. Harrison. Congratulations on your promotion. <laughs> Are we fake? <laughs> I think you might have said yesterday we had probably not the simplest education financing system. Maybe we had the most complicated. I'm not sure I'd agree with that, but well, I, but, I, but people don't understand said it because it, right? it, it's it's different. It's okay. Different. How does this simplify? And are you available for town meetings <laughs> to explain this? I tend to go to school board meetings, but not town meetings. Yeah, I've been to a few and I've gotten yelled at. I think on some of David uh, Representative Gacovoni's constituents once or twice. <laughs> um, um, th th this is this is how it's working currently. Okay, this, this basically all we're doing, most people understand the concept of adding weights. Well, we add them for high school, and, and, and maybe it's just because I'm not exposed to the inner workings of how we treat a, you know, say a K through eight student. Well, well let, me, let me back up a second then, and because I don't think I did this yesterday. Um, but what the researchers did was they, they took they took lots of data from me, from, you know, Vermont, and they looked at region wide, and they you know, looked at a lot of different things. And what they did is they, they created, and I have not seen the model, but they created a rather um, detailed statistical model. And they ran a lot of regression analysis on it. And what that's doing is it's saying that these are the important factors because they're measures within, a, within analysis, within statistics that tell you these things. So really kind of, I mean, if you, if you simplify it, what, what, a re, what a regression coefficient is doing is really showing you the slope of a line is what it's doing. So what they were doing is they were saying, which ones are significant? They had a whole bunch of factors. And these are the factors that they, that they pulled out. These, these are the ones that really they could see made a difference in terms of what, what they perceived outcomes should be, how to, how to get there. So that, that's, that's the, the, the background of what they did. Um, there, are three different, there are three different sparsity categories, and there are two different small school categories based on two-year average enrollments. Because what they saw were inflection points in the in those regression curves, they, they they would go like this. Well, I guess I should, I should say they would go like this, and then they would change and flatten out a little bit, and then change and flatten more. And those inflection points are what are reflected here in terms of the the categories they're doing. So what they're looking at is they're looking at where they think the costs are breaking and changing. That's why that's why we have different ones for a couple of these. The other ones, um, what they did, especially with ELL is they, they looked at, um, I think they used across country, country information plus our information, plus regional information. And they, they kind of came to the focus that this was the correct number to be using. Again, it's all based on their model, which I have not seen. If I were to see it, I probably got to go, oh, that's lovely, because my statistics are pretty far back. Um, and, you know, but, but we do have, but one of the proposals in, in S-287 is that the regression model will become 
joint property of AOE and JFO, and we will be running it later on. So I've talked to people on our side, on our data side, who have far more statistical horsepower than I do, and they said they can do this, but they're going to need to sit down with the research and see what went into the models, how the models went, because there are a lot of assumptions in all these things. So they're going to, they need to do that. But the, if, if this passes and goes through, then that's what will happen with the regression. It will become, it will become ours. So it's, it's, re it's really based on what they were seeing. I don't want to say on average, on average but because that's not quite right. But that, what they're seeing as, 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 a, as kind of, I mean, oh, I'm going to say it, as, as the average cost of bringing a student up to a certain level. That's, that's really what they would do. Probably more words than needed. I apologize. Yeah. Okay, so so if, I, I want to point you to, to uh, number four. Also, district with small schools. Excuse me, with small schools. We use the two-year average enrollment here because what the thought was from the researchers was the cost and the the, the benefit should accrue only from those students in those schools, not everybody else in the school district. So you could have a school district that had five schools, and only if one of them was a small school, that's who the weight would be applied to, was that one small school, the kids in those small schools. That's why it's the two-year enrollment. So in the case of District A, they receive a small schools grant, they, they were sparse, they receive a small schools grant for being under 100, because they had one school that was under 100. They had 77 kids there, that was the two-year average enrollment. So that gave them an additional weight of 16. In this specific instance, I think they had four schools that were between 100 and 250, two year, average two-year enrollment. So that's that 646 number. That's that total aggregated two-year enrollment for those four schools. And that gives them an additional weight of 45. So it's possible for a district to have no schools get anything here or to have one school or multiple schools in both categories. And that's why I chose this district. And then again, if you go over to column, District B and District C do not get it, they don't have small schools and they were sparse anyway. And District D is sparse and they did have a small school, but that's just one school, 187 kids. And so they get an additional 13 weight. Okay. And then ELL is just the count. You know, how many kids you have? Most kids are in Chittenden County. Most of all students are in Chittenden County. So that's, that's where the weights are generally going. I, I, I checked last night, 83% of the FY20 ELL students are in Chittenden County, 83%. There's quite a few. Now, I think there are 1,780, yeah, there are, it's right over there in column nine at the bottom, 1,780 students, 83% are in Chittenden County. So that's, that's where that population tends to be. There's some here in Washington. The rest is spread out in one dribbles and reds. So that's that's how the weights are done. If we jump to the next slide, slide four, page four, whichever it is, everything's the same up top. The only thing new is the added weights line at the bottom. All I've done here is I've added up, I've totaled the weights for each of the districts and the state. So you can check my math just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure Excel did it right. Um, District A receives an additional 868 eight, eight in terms of weighting. Okay, and you can just read across the board. Oh, not rocket science for that one. So far, pretty straightforward, I think. Page five. Question? Yeah, Brett Shy. Thank you. So, did, am I reading this right that the <clears throat> District C has added weights that? total more than the actual number of students that they have? So they're more than doubling their weights? You are. You are reading that correctly. Okay. And, and, and actually that's a slide further on. I'm gonna compare the two as, okay. as, as, we, get, as we get down. But, but you're, but you're, it was more dramatic than I expected. Okay. It, it, it is dramatic. <laughs> um, but but if, you, if you look, you see that if you go up to line two poverty, they have 500 right. poverty. So they get eight, 517 an additional weight of 517 on right. top of it. So that, that takes up over a third of, of their, their yeah. total. And English total. language learners is the other big one. Okay. That's right, yes. You can, you can see how it adds in there, okay? Yeah, thanks. Well, so, so page five, 
everything's the same except the next line down, which is the weights plus the long-term ADM. So what I've now done is I've added in the weights to line 1E, the, the long-term ADM, the blue line up there at the top, okay? And so that's the long, this, this line represents the long-term weighted ADM. You could stop here because people understand it up to this point, <laughs> okay? We'll come back to that statement in a moment. If we go to page six, this is everybody's favorite. Snap top, new line, the equalization ratio. This is where we lose people, okay? Remember, we started out with a certain number of students in the state, and we have to get better. Now we have too many because of the weights. And so this is the calculation to get to them. In this case, and this is coming from the model, the state had 87,494 long-term ADM. When you add all those weights, that 54,393 additional weights, you get 141,887. When you divide that, you get about 0.62. Right? That's the equalization ratio. And again, I said it yesterday, but just for context, the current equalization ratio is closer to 93, 94%. But we're adding so many weights in this new model and not only new weighting, fact, new weighting factors and categories, but we're increasing the weights that we're really increasing the denominator. That's why I promise. Okay, and then last page, no, page seven, it's not last page, I apologize. We then do the equalized pupil calculation. And all I did here, all I did, what I did here, is I took that equalization ratio of roughly 0 0.62 and I multiplied it by each long-term weight for each district. So for District A, I took that 2,365, which is a long-term weight at ADM, multiplied by 0.62, and I got an equalized pupil count of 1,458. Okay? And you can see, if you look over to line 10 at the very, or column 10, pardon me, at the very bottom for the state, that we're back to almost the long-term ADM. We're at 87,493. We started at 87,494. That's all rounding the background. Yeah, but but that, that's what's happening. That's what the equalization ratio is doing. And again, this is where we lose people. So you could, well, I'll, go, I'll go to the last page first, and then I'll, then I'll go to my part of the so page eight, all I'm doing now is I'm showing what the equalized pupil count is versus the long-term ADM. See that District A lost, okay? They have fewer equalized pupils than didn't have long-term ADM. District B also went down. District C went up dramatically as Representative I noticed, okay? And District D also went up significantly. But the state as a whole is about the same. Yeah. That's what's happening with them because of the equalization ratio. And it's that equalized pupil count that then goes to the tax rate. So going back to what I said earlier, you can stop before the equalization ratio. If you were to stop right at that point and not do the equalization and use long-term ADM, weighted ADM, as your pupil count, what would happen is everything else being constant, education spending per pupil would decrease because you've got a bigger number for everybody. Everybody understands that. You added weights, my number's bigger. But if you go to equalization, say you added weights, but my number's smaller, you know, that's, that's, that's where people's heads go like this. Just the math. It, it is just math, but it's, it's adding and subtracting. It's very complex sometimes. Oh, it's <laughs> There's both in there too, that's right. And we, we even round it too. <laughs> but no, it is, but, but a lot of people don't get the concept, but that's okay. Um, Hang on, uh, Rep Harrison? Yeah. yeah, no, I get what you're saying, but it's gonna come out the same. It, exactly, the same. exactly. Um, but I just wanna go back to the waiting. Do we provide any waiting today for uh, English learning because that's that's yeah. we do we do 0 0.2 0 0.2 and now we're going to what 2.49 2 okay so it, that's where the big difference is. yes okay yes. thank you yes and the other the other big difference is poverty is what poverty. poverty what do we do for poverty now uh we what is 0 0.25 and this is 1.03 so so four times And we, we also, in, in this model, we also increase the poverty count. We 
use a different count that we have. Can we do this last chart today with the uh, bringing it back? You mean, you mean the total equalized pupils? Yeah. Yes, I do. That's 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 what school districts receive from me, so that they don't have okay. to capture. All right. Thank you. So if if we were to use long-term weighted ADM instead of the equalized pupils, everybody's numbers would be higher than where they started, which would make everybody happy. Spending per pupil would decrease, which means tax rates would decrease, which means not enough money comes into the education fund. So what would happen is the yield would have to decrease in order to push those tax rates back up to the right level. You'd be right back where you start from, but people would understand what happened in the background a little bit. So there's a simpler way to get to the same result. Well, under the current system, um, this, this, the, the best thing you can do for simplifying is get rid of the equalization ratio. Get rid of the right. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that would be and you get the same results. And you get the same results because because the yield would change. The yield will go down, yeah. so tax would go right back to where they were under the current system. Yeah. And, you know, the fund would have enough money. I'm just thinking about why the choices that people would make. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. We're not going to ask you any questions. <laughs> we don't want to get confused. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. We have this tenuous grasp. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Ms. Richter, I don't know what to do because you're not going to be able to get us through the cost adjustment factor. In, in 15 minutes. Do you want to start? It's completely up to the committee. I would be happy to come back at a later time and walk through if you want to keep going with Brad or I can start with cost factor adjustments, whatever would be the most. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. James, were you done? I was. I, I, I can easily be done, but as I said yesterday, I can go on forever. Um, I, did, I did bring more. I did bring, I, I brought, and I won't go through it, but I did bring the, the second one. It's called, I think, starts the B in your, um, in your online. Let, so let's do that. Let's okay. finish up with you and Ms. Richter. I'm sorry. Thank yes. you for joining us. And Bye. I'll come back at a later date. Yeah. You know. she's, done, she's done it to me too, so it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's well, more of what we're doing is playing with you. Um, but yeah, and, and I think it is important to understand the cost factor adjustments because there is a policy question yes. that is being wrestled with in ways and means about which way to go, weighting or cost factor adjustments. And so sorry folks, we have to kind of have a grasp of both. I, I think I think it's important to kind of take a semi-deep dive on, yeah. on both ones. So. Yeah. But I'll, I'll try to be a little bit quicker on this one. So um, I don't have this labeled outside saying transition steps as proposed in S-287. And then the first line says the weighting model is based on FY 2020 data. <laughs> People seen that one? Okay. All right. Basically, what this, is, this is just kind of a very quick overview of what's happening in, in 287, what, what some of the background is. Um, eight, that first paragraph, I'm not, I'm not going to really go through it unless you want me to, but I'll kind of do a quick overview. It's, it's really the category that we used, okay? We use what we use when we use single year data. We use FY20 data for our modeling. That's what we did. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to say, here's what FY20 was. If we did this, here's what it would have been. Okay? We kept everything else constant pretty much except for the equalized pupil count. However, that did make a difference because we changed the equalized pupil count. As I said, spending per pupil changes, tax rates change you need to change the property yield. So the property yield also changed this. So those are the two things that really changed. There are assumptions behind the FY20 data that we use that was slightly different. Um, I'll go through those if you'd like me to, but, or, or we're gonna just jump over them, just assume that they're different. But, but what it boils down to is, the, what we're saying is the base FY20 for modeling is not what people saw for FY20 in reality. It's similar, but it's not the same. I'm looking at puzzled eyes, so I'll tell you why. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there, remember, Act 46 had had merger incentives. Some of them, some of them were reducing tax rates for districts that voluntarily merged. The last districts that voluntarily merged started in FY21. So they had eight cents off their tax rate. Other districts still had six cents. Some had four cents. Some had two cents still. 
the, the committee decided that they wanted to take that out of the equation. Another piece of that was also from Act 46 was a town's property tax rate could not go up by more than five, could not change by more than 5% either way from year to year as it goes to its new tax rate from its new unified district. So if we had a, if we had a unified district that had a new rate, new, new district had a tax rate of $1.50, Act 60 allowed it to take eight cents off. So its tax rate to its member towns was $1.42. If a town, so so five, I'm going to round five percent of a dollar forty-two is seven cents. So if you subtract seven cents from a dollar forty-two, you get a dollar thirty-five. If a town's tax rate was below a dollar thirty-five, let's call it a dollar twenty, it could only increase by five percent, so another six cents to a dollar twenty-six. If a tax rate was up here of say a dollar sixty, but it's supposed to be getting to that when I say dollar thirty forty-two. It can only decrease by 5% at the most. So that's eight cents. So it could be down to $1.52. That, that's what's happening. If they're within that range, they go to the tax rate. So those, those were in play. And so they were affecting everything in terms of the education fund, tax rates and such. So the decision was made to forgo all Act, Act 46 incentives. So what, what we did in the background was we re-ran we re FY20 data without Act 46 incentives. And what that did is the tax rates that resulted from it, this is, this is not, not the modeling itself, the, the weighting part. This is just before we get to that point. What that did is the tax rates changed enough that too much money was coming into the education fund. So the property yield had to go up to bring the tax rates down so that the right amount of money was coming into the education fund. That's, that's a subtle one. Yeah, so I think we're there. I okay. We're waiting for the Okay, so, and so, therefore. so, and therefore, perfect, good, good leading. And therefore, not a single district has the tax rate, that, or in the model that I use, that we created as the base, has the tax rate that it started out with, really, in FY20, because we changed the yield. Other people have lost it in there because of the incentives, but because the yield itself changed, Everybody's tax rate is different, but they're all on the same footing, whereas before they weren't. That's where I'm lost okay. because you've changed. So if, if you're a district that did not have an Act 46 incentive, okay, so let's say your tax rate was $1.50 and the yield was $12,000, you, you get a certain tax, you, you know, that gave you tax rate. When the incentives were taken away from Everywhere else. Everywhere else. Their tax rates are higher. So more money was coming to the ed fund. So that $12,000 yield would have been, was projected. So that $12,000 yield would go up to lower the tax rate. So let's say it goes to 13000 something like that. Your $1.50 tax rate is now going to change to something lower. So everybody's tax rate has changed. Everybody's tax rate has changed. Yes. Everybody's payment has not changed. Well, yeah, right. We, have, we, we, we didn't change. We didn't change education spending yeah. at all, and we kept equalized pupils' costs for this. This is this is before we get to the model for the waiting part. You know, everything is. We just we we adjusted the real FY twenty to take out Act forty six, and so nobody's tax rate is what they saw in, in FY twenty. It feels like there's a little, there, a sleight of hand going on. <laughs> I understand that, it does. Except, except, except it's not what really happened. What really happened, happened already. <laughs> you know, we, we use FY20 numbers yeah. because they wanted to avoid the, the influence of the pandemic. Okay, and that, that's why they went back to FY20 instead of using FY21. Or we could have used FY22 at that point. Um, but, but because of the, the changes due to the pandemic, Student counts changed, the spending changed, you know, they had all these costs they didn't expect. Some got covered by federal money, some did not. You know, that's why they wanted to avoid that. So we went back to FY20. And so there were a lot of issues, in, not issues, but a lot, of, a lot of reduced tax rates because of Act 46. And they're all going to be gone, if they're not already, by FY24. That's, this is the last year we're going into them, and they're gone. Okay, because they, they've, they've timed out, basically is what, what's happening. So in fact, they're not relevant 
if they're going to be gone, they're not relevant in whatever changes that's right. they be made in the that's, that's right. So there is not a slight of hand. <laughs> okay. Um, so there could be argued there is in the sense that the state does not stay static. We know that populations and other things have changed. So going back to 2020, yeah. as if none of this has happened, I don't know, that's got a certain je ne sais quoi factor, right? I, 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 don't, I don't disagree, but, but it, was, it was what the consensus of the committee was, and I was just looking for it yeah. <laughs> at that point. Yeah, so. Okay? Got it. Oh, okay. At this very moment. No, no, it's, it's, it's good, because, because it, I mean, it's not something that I talk about a lot. And it's not something that people understand necessarily easily. I mean, it's, I live in this weird world, and I get it. Um, so, but, but, so, so what, what I'm saying, the base FY20 numbers for the model, it's not what really happened in FY20. It's based on that, but that's not what it was. That's really what it boils down to. So that's, that's what A, B, C, and D are talking about there. Um, so what happened, what happened in the modeling is that some of the tax rate changes, quite a few of them were, were quite significant, both going up and going down. So the task force decided, and I guess I should say at this point, the Senate decided that they wanted to have a transition method coming in. They talked about a lot of things in the task force, and they kind of settled on averaging equalized pupils. <coughs> so this is where it gets a little more squirrely when you see what I've done in the past, but not yet. So this section where I have one, two, three, four, five, these are the five years in, in, F, in um, S287 of averaging equalized pupils. So what they're doing is the first year this will happen is at FY24. So what they're doing is they're saying take FY24 and average it with the four prior years. Four prior years are current law. Okay. So we, we you know it's under the old system. The current system, but on the old, would be the old system. Not monkeyed with? Not monkeyed with. It, it be not monkeyed with. Oh. Because equalized pupil counts were not monkeyed with in, in, in any okay. okay. So so really what I did here for FY, for, and I didn't, but, but I, what I would do is for FY 20, 21, 22, and 23, I would take the actual equalized pupil counts that I have. I would average those with whatever the new weights create for the FY24, so that's going to be the first year of new calculation, and we would average that. Okay, so I, the, the new calculations are in blue and underlined, just so people could see how it changes. Then in year two, we again we do five years, the current year, the current year plus the four part. But now we have two number, two years of new calculation. In year three, which would be FY26, again prior four years plus the new plus the new year but we have three years of the new calculation now. So what we're doing is we're phasing things out over time. That's, that's, that's how it's designed to work, and it's to smooth the transitions. Then in year four, instead of using four prior years, they use three prior years. But in this case, it happens to be all new calculation. So we're actually where we should be in terms of the calculation itself, the weights. And then in year five, instead of three prior years, it's two prior years. And it's going to be the, the equalized people count to be used each year annually in, F, in S287 is a three-year average of equalized pupils. So we're averaging an average is what we're averaging averages is what we're doing. Okay, that's that's what's happening here. Um, one question, Brett Harrison. So oh, Brad, uh, maybe I'm missing something, but what's the difference? Between averaging two years, whether you're averaging three or averaging two, I mean, if everything is constant, I mean, those are the new numbers. Well, it, it, I, I think I think what what I was not in the Senate Finance when they were discussing this this section, but my understanding is what they were thinking was there are some districts that are growing quickly, um, and so if if you have too many years of averaging, you're you're going to be losing that that growth that you should be benefiting from. In terms of your tax rates and such, your spending should go up, but so but your your pupil count should be going up. You do too okay. many years out; it's not going to be. Yeah, good. I thought on the chart to make any sense of it, you sort of have to the, freeze everything. The, 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 chart, the chart's different because I did. And I'm, I'm going to come to that. Okay. So, but the, the chart is different. You're quite right. Okay. Okay, because I did I did do something different there. And Brett Helm. Yeah, Brett. Um, 
I'm just curious. When towns putting together their tax bills, what do they do? Put all this together, consumer by you know, home landowner by landowner, and then ship you it in short form and you calculate it or do they have some kind of now what 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 hap what happens is um the way the process works is i take education spending and all the equalized peoples and i calculate what's called the equalized tax rate okay, before the cla is, is applied i have the clas and i calculate it but i send all that information over sans the cla adjustment over to the tax department they, they run it based on the data that I'm getting, and then we compare actual tax rates before they go. So we're, we're checking each other, okay? At that point, we agree, and they send tax rates out to the town. The town then sends out the tax rate, and it's, it's prescribed, they show the equalized rate, the common level of appraisal, how you get to the tax rate that you pay versus your education property value. And then you have the municipal part with the different, with, with the same house value. You, that you got, but we're not worried about the municipal part. So the towns are then raising money. In the meantime, they're, they're submitting their, I guess, Form 411, their, their grand list form to the property valuation interview, all the towns send in, and PVNR then sends me the grand list data by town. So I see for any given town, I see the homestead grand list and the non homestead grand list. It's just an aggregate number. So I don't, I don't care about individual taxpayers. The tax department does, I don't. Okay. So I, I then have these two numbers. I know what their tax rates are. I know what the homestead tax rate is. I know what the non-homestead non tax rate is. And so I know how much money each town should be raising. That's, that's where that comes from. Then, then what I'm doing, again, I think I mentioned this yesterday, then I'm, I'm looking at how much that's, let, let's just say it's one town, one school, let's call it. Um, well, I can't do you not Peter anymore. Um, Springfield, okay, or Rutland City. How's the school doing Rutland City? Okay, um, Rutland City is a single school district and it's a single town, it's a, well, city, okay? So it's only one one set of data. So I, I see the grand list, I see the, the homestead, the tax rates, I know how much money they can raise, and I know how much money the school district needs. So I then tell the town, send your homestead property tax to the school district. Do they still need more? Yes. Send your non-residential, non-homestead taxes that you've raised, education taxes, to the school district. Do they still need more? Most cases, yes. So then I send the difference from the education fund. If you're a town like mine, so its obligation is not met to its school district, is not met by the homestead, but because of the size of its non-homestead grant list, it only needs to send a portion of it to the school district and its obligation is the town, the town's obligation is filled to the school district. The remainder of that non-homestead property then goes to the treasures over here. <laughs> They're over there. Um, then, goes, then goes to the treasury. And that in turn goes in with the, the property, with the uh, income tax or the sales tax, the purchase and use tax, um, certain, the lottery, Medicaid, those other pieces of the ed fund. And that's what I use to send back out to the school districts when they need more money. Sounds like it'd take about a year. <laughs> it, it actually, it actually, well, because Graham has changed, <laughs> in fact, we pay three times a year and bill twice a year, it does. But actually, all in all, if things didn't change, it could be done once. It, it, can, it could be done. It could be done in, in mid-September if, if all the tax credits were right, people like to wait on their tax credits. If the grand lists were right, people weren't appealing. Um, but, but the school district part, the, the, what they need and the tax rate is all set. That's not what changed. It's the grand list that changes because people are appealing. It's, it's the uh, homestead tax credits that change because a lot of people late file, so they don't, they put in, they put in a, you know, some, some whole placeholder number, then the real one comes in, it's, it's different. So we have, we all these things that, that's what really takes so long. It could happen once though. So is, is there a state in the U.S. that has a more complicated system? <laughs> I have talked to, I mean, in some national conferences, most of them tend to be about data as opposed to education finance. 
but I've, ta I've talked to some people about how they find it, how they fund their schools. And I, and I look at them, and I think, and some, some are based on years of teachers, experience and such. Um, they're, they're all different. I mean, I think most of them have some type of foundation formula where they're saying that you get this much money and then because of this kind of population, we get extra money. Okay, it's, it's, it's what a lot of us, so some form of that. We're different in that sense. Um, we, we, I will say, and there was a couple studies that, that agreed that we're the most equitable in terms of how we raise the money. Um, but we still let, let individual school districts decide how much they're going to spend, the voters decide. You know, we don't, we don't tell them what to do. In other states, that's not the case. In other states, they don't have people saying, this is what I want to spend, the state tells them. So, so I, I mean, it, people think it's complex. I live in it. I don't think it's complex, but that's because I live in it. Um, but it, it's hard to say if we're more complex than anybody else. They're all different, I think. Thank you. You got some personal opinion in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, oh, the one, the one thing I wanted to add or point out in this in this is when I, and, and we're just going to come to just to, well I'll just talk, talk about it. is in in, in S two eighty seven um, they have the ELL weight of two point four nine, but what they what the Senate decided was and this came from Senate Education what they decided was that if you're one of those districts that have not many ELL kids. And maybe you still need a little bit of help getting to help pay for a part-time teacher or instructor or some sort of something like that or for outreach or something like that. So what the, what they put into the bill is if you're a district that has one to five ELL students, you get an additional twenty-five thousand dollars to help with that person. If you're if you're a district that has six to twenty-five ELL students, you get an additional fifty thousand okay. dollars. So they're I mean I think they, they call them. Mini grants is kind of how they say, how they call the term, but they, you know, they're not called anything in particular, but I think that's the term they tend to use when we're talking about them. So th those are there. Those are going to be incorporated into what you're about to see. Okay, the, those, those small grants are going to be incorporated. Okay. You also get the weight, by the way, for all these kids, but you get those mini grants too. Okay. So we have a question, Mr. James. Rep Giacoboni. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is the part I had a question on. So if you're getting the weight, what is it, 2.49? Yes. You're getting, you're getting the weight for the uh, ELL, plus you're getting this. What was the, uh, was there the belief that the weight wasn't sufficient? I, I, I think in that, in that sense, when they have a small population, yes. I mean, the distribution of, of ELL students is pretty skewed. As I said, as I said, okay. Over 80% are, are in um, in Chittenden County, um, and then I, and there there are a few here in this area in Washington County. You know that have maybe 20 or 30 kids. Then most of the rest of them are about five, nine, two, one. There are a lot of ones, a lot of two, the three. Okay. They, they were thinking that that weight would not be enough. They wanted to help. It's what they wanted to do. Okay. And a non-related question: um, students with disabilities. There's no special weight. Is that because there's the assumption they all fall into special ed? Yes. yes. Okay. So there's no extra recognition. There's, there. there, there's no there's no extra weight for special education. Um, they they're a separate funding system to, to a large extent. We're going to okay. send. It. Thank you, Brent. Mm -hmm. Well, you set off a bunch of questions. That's okay. Shy. Thanks, um, Brad. I'm. Am I correct in thinking that the extra twenty five thousand or the extra fifty thousand is not per student? It's one lump sum payment. It is one lump sum payment. It is not right. per student. Thank you. And Rep. Fagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Brad, thanks for coming in. So I have a little more of a of a complex question. I've been having a discussion with with someone here in the city, saying uh, who is positing that uh, that the schools have been underfunded. Uh, and I am saying, no, they're not, because the school board is able to, to set a budget based upon the needs of the students. And if, in fact, they are not setting a budget based upon the needs of the students, the, the school board itself is doing that, and not the way that the, the formula, as it currently stands, works. Can you uh, help shed a little light into the, uh, into the argument, please? 
Well, we're, we're on the Brad James personal opinion now. That's fine. <laughs> but but I, I would completely agree with you. Um, I, I do not think people have been underfunded. I think that, that people have, cho have chosen to spend what they choose to spend. We can see that scattered all over the place. I do think that, that the tax rates could be different because of this calculation, which is, which is actually a different argument. But I, don't, I, I, I agree with you. I do not think they've been underfunded because, because the school boards are deciding what they need to spend on their students with their necessary or needs and requirements and, and any associated services that are required. The boards are deciding that. Then the voters can say yes or no to that. But, it's, but, I, but I agree with you. They are not being underfunded. Thank you. Um, we're back to you, Brad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to enthrall you some more then. I'll, I'll, this, this will be sort of quick, I hope. So we're now on, I believe, what's called C. It's a, it's a table that looks like this. Okay. There. Okay. Everybody's there? All right. And what, what this is, without, don't even look at it yet. What, what this is, this is, <laughs> no, I, I, I would be looking, I'd be looking at it too. I'd be at the last page. I'd be going, what the? <laughs> You're not a school teacher, are you? I used to be. I can come. Oh, I used to be. Um, so, so the first two pages are modeling that trend, that equalized pupil transition over five years. That's what, that's what it is. However, what it's doing is it's using, again, like I said at the beginning, we're, we're looking at FY20, trying to compare, like, if this was in place in FY20, how did it compare to what happened? So we're going to FY20. So what I'm really using is old data. I'm using FY16 pupil counts up to FY20. That's what I'm really doing here, okay? Because I was not going to try to project out FY20 counts because I know how hard that is I've tried to do that before and how accurate I am not. Um, so. So, so, so we're, we're using real counts here for FY16, 17, 18, and 19 in year one. And then we're using FY20, the new weights. Now, I just said I didn't project out FY20 numbers to FY21. So, what, so for year two, when we're using five years, five, four year prior years, we're using two old years, three old years, pardon me. And then I use FY20 twice because I don't have numbers, I didn't project out for FY21. So for every every year we step across, so if you remember what I showed you here on that handout with the blue ones, each of those blue ones are FY20, because I did not project. So, so what we're doing is we're migrating towards the FY20 count, artificial, I might add, but that's what we're doing here. And again, the reason is because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show if this was in place, fully implemented for FY20, here's what would have happened. I, and also means I don't have to try to project out into FY21, 22, and 23, and 24, because I know how the numbers we've got. So, that, so, so this, is, this is really what we're looking at here. So in column one on the first two pages is what our FY20 equalized pupils really were. Column seven on the first two pages is the difference between where we end up when, under full implementation, so in column six, so all FY20, um, and the difference between that and, and, and the original FY20 numbers, column one. That's, that's what column seven is. And so you can just see how equalized people change. Okay, so, so in other words, if you want to ignore the transition totally and said, here's where we were in FY20, that's column one. <clears throat> if S287 was as written was in place in FY20, here's where it'd be, that's column six. It's, it's an easier way to think about it, but people want to see that transition, which I did for other people. Okay. So you can see who went up, who went down in terms of equalized pupils. And then if you go to pages three and four, I did the corresponding tax rates. You'll see at the top that the yield changed from your was it original FY20 from 10,018, and then I kept it constant at 11,107. It really wouldn't be in real life, but that we kept it constant just to make sense of work. And again, all I did here was I took these new equalized pupil counts for each count, divided into education spending, got the tax rate, got the spending for people, got the tax rate with the new yield, and here we are. Again, FY20 is what we call what we're calling the base FY20 numbers. 
with those caveats from the very beginning. That's where we started out. If 287 was in place fully, that would be column six. Now you can ignore the ones in between. And then column four, or not column six, my apologies, column 13. Okay, so we're looking at columns eight as the original, column 13 as the final, and then column 14 is the difference. So there you can see what, how the tax rates have changed. Had we been in this fully implemented in FY20 versus what we were, where we really essentially were in FY20. Okay. And you can see some big changes in here. And that's, that's why they're looking at transitions of some sort or another. And there's lots of discussion going on ways and beats about that. And then lastly, I know you're just waiting for this part. Lastly, is, is just this, this, I think it's D on your sheets. It's just, it's just the, I'm not gonna go through it. It's just kind of a, a description of what I did and the assumptions that, that you're looking at here in this, in this handout. Okay, that's, that's really all I have. And I have the caveats down there too. I've talked about that. And that's what I have to say to you. I am really glad that I am not going to be tested on this <laughs> because I would need some help. Uh, absolutely. Be retested. And yeah, but. Yeah, it, I mean, just, just to address that point, it's not something I expect anybody to understand the first time around. I mean, I wouldn't either. But, but, I, but I've, I've been here since the beginning. I've been doing the modeling. You know, it's, it's ingrained in me at this point to, to do it. Um, so, but no, it, it, reach out with questions. That's perfectly fine. I, I am happy to answer questions. Um, but, but no, nobody's going to get this and pick it up right away like that. So what you've done is describe to us where uh, S287 is at this point. And then there is a conversation going on here about whether or not we agree with that, or is there a different way to essentially implement the concept behind 287, get to the same place, but is there a different way to accomplish that? And, 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 and that's, what, that's what Julie will talk about, the cost factor adjustment model. Uh, initially it was called cost equities, now I'm gonna switch over to cost factor adjustment model, so I'll say cost equity half the time. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that, that's what that one's about. And instead of using weights, like we went through the equalized pupil count, and what we just went through, what they're using is a, a dollar amount per, per pupil per category. So it's essentially what you would do is you would look at, at that table I, I gave you, you know, where I kind of walked through the four real examples, and you would look at those pupil counts in each of those categories, and you would multiply it by this cost factor dollar amount. And so that would be money that would then go to the school district. It would reduce their education spending. Okay, so now you're spending for puberty. And, and, oh, and our denominator has changed. We're not using equalized pupils anymore. We're using long-term ADM. So that would be that line E here okay, in, the, in the blue. We're using long-term ADM as the pupil count. So what would happen is your spending per pupil would decrease significantly. So the yield, instead of being around 11,300, where it is roughly currently right now, would drop to about 7,700 to bring the tax rates up to the right point where they come in. And it has to pay for the amount of money that we're taking off the top of the ed fund with these categorical, well, not categorical, um, cost factor adjustment grants. There are amounts, I should say, they're not even grants, they're amounts. And the idea is that you're giving the people the money for that population that they need um, in both in both the uh, Senate Bill 287 and what, it, what Ways and Means is talking about right now, you, there, the money can be used for anything, doesn't have to be used for those specific categories, except for ELL. ELL has to be used for ELL students. Okay. Okay, so, so for, everything else could arguably be used to reduce your taxes, yep. except for ELL. You have to spend. If I get fifty thousand, I have to spend fifty thousand on ELL. Yeah, it, it's it's not it's not so much reducing taxes as it, as it is saying okay, here's your budget because you're still going to vote on a full budget. That's not going right. to change. Okay, but instead of looking at education spending as you know taking this part off for the offsetting revenues like I talked about, it's going to be this much more. So, you, but you still have this piece here of education spending. Okay, am I, am I losing people on that or no? There's less play. There's, there, less, there's less play, exactly. There's, there's less play. And so the, the, the spending per pupil decreases too, because you've got a much smaller numerator. 
and the denominator will change somewhat. You can see that. But, so the yield has to change to bring the tax rates back up to where they need to be. It has to drop. So, but, but I mean, it's, it, it, what it does, it affects different districts differently than weighting does. Yeah, it doesn't affect them the same way. Um, and part of it has to do with, you know, who's, who's operating a school, who's not operating a school, who's sparse, who's not sparse, because you're not getting that money. Just, just like you're not getting that way, except, except they, they don't quite work exactly the same way, but they're, they're, they're similar to one another. Is it just a proxy for weighting? Is that what you're- It's saying? based on weighting, yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean to, to tell you where the numbers came from, what, what, um, what the researchers did was they took, again, they, they calculated the weights, they calculated what the long-term weighted ADM is, okay, so they, they applied all the weights like we did in this, okay, and they said we had, what, 141,000 students. They took, they took, the FY18 education spending, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head by any means, but they took that number, divided it by that roughly $141,000, and they got an average cost for an average student. That's what they got. And so it was around $9,200, something like that. And an average student in this case would be a K-5 student in a non-sparse district, in a school with a two-year enrollment, bigger than 250, not ELL, and not from an economically deprived background. That would be your average student. And then what they did is said, okay, 9,219 is each one. Again, based on kind of what I said to Representative Harrison as to where these numbers came from, they were saying, if you have this base, 9,200 in this case, then how much does it cost to bring this, this category of student up to, the, to, to, to proficiency, or wherever the, whatever the measure was? That's what they were doing. And that's what the weights are doing too, just not quite as transparent in this case. So you would take the 9219 and multiply it by each weight. So for poverty, the weight's 1.03. You would take that 9219, that's what the number is, 90, um, multiply 1.03, and that's the cost factor adjustment for poverty. for poverty. And then you say, okay, I've got 100 kids. You take whatever that cost factor is times 100 you get. The, the 92-19 was FY18 numbers. The numbers that you'll see in, in drafts and such and that what Julia will be talking about are for FY23. And so what, what Tammy Colby's, Professor Colby's group decided to do was, was just inflate it by, you know, they guessed 2% annually up to FY23. So the base becomes more, I can't remember what it was. I want to say maybe 10,000. 170, something like that. It's it's you know around, around 10,000 chicks, something like that. So that's what that's what B bunch of questions. Yeah. Rep Feltus, Jessa, <laughs> and Yakabuck, yeah. and Townsend. Well, mine is, is just simple, I think, back to this chart you gave us. Oh, yeah. I just want to clarify that these are not projections going forward of yeah. what might happen and projections in the future. This is correct. what would have happened if we had done this in 2020. With, with, that's right. With that column, column six or column 13. Yes, that's, that's, what, that's what would happen. The, the rest is just kind of people wanted to see it said, okay, it's not going to show much, but there it is. Okay. Yes, you're, you're exactly right. These are not projections. Okay. And, um, Oh, no, no, that's just um, you, you caught my attention when you used an inflator of 2%, and that strikes me as something that is potentially higher currently. And so yes. does that argue that this approach could become, for lack of a better word, stale? Quickly, even the same shelf life? I like that term. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it could. But but again, the discussion, some of the discussion, how are you going to adjust that? Are you going to have an inflation factor built in or not? Um, or are we going to come back and revisit it every five years? Those are those, some of the discussions. In, in uh, 287, they come back and revisit every so often, every five years or so. But, but again, they, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know why they chose 2%. They chose 2% and kept it constant. So fine. Yeah, this is an estimate. Rep. Yacoboni. Uh, yes. So if Town A takes their cost factor, if that method is used, and uses it to reduce taxes, and Town B takes their revenue from the cost factor and uses it to provide more educational services, aren't we adding to the 
haves and the have nots in terms of educational opportunity? Well, you, I, th I think regardless of which system we're talking or model we're talking about weighting versus cost factor adjustment, I think in both cases, we're, we're probably talking about increasing the amount of education spending. Because I think, I think the districts that are finally have tax capacity or additional money because of, because of the cost factors will, will bring some more money in and, and spend more on their kids, which is desirable. That's what, that's what we're after. I you're, think, you're not, you're confident of that. I'm, I'm confident enough that I'm willing to put it out there and say, I think this is what will happen, yes. Can I guarantee it? No, but I'm pretty sure that will happen. I would, I would certainly like, that's the idea. Ideally, it would all be going to the kids. You know, any, any, any increase would be going to the kids. But mm -hmm. again, we're a local control state. People make their decisions. Um, sure. And, and I, think, I think the towns, the districts and towns that are high, that are gonna, their, their taxes are gonna be going up. And I think, I think my guess is that they probably won't, they probably won't come down all the way. My guess is they'll probably stay, you know, somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's hard to say. When we're talking, we're talking about human nature here, and I'm not very good at interpreting that all the time. Um, well, you're <laughs> thank you. I want to challenge you on that. Okay. I, I think, but I think we'll just have to wait and see. It, I mean, because there really is a difference in how communities think about how much they're really able is. to spend on education. And, really different decisions. You, you do, and I think that goes to what Representative Fagan was saying, was districts are choosing to spend what they what they think they should spend. Right. You know, do the same, do two different districts think the same way? No. Yeah. They, they don't. And, and we, we can see that with, with the spending per pupil numbers and the, the range that we have currently. You know, pe people aren't choosing to spend the same amounts. Um, you know, are they right or wrong? I don't know. Yeah. But, but, but that, that's what I'm saying in, in terms of Representative Yacoboni's question. Is that, I, that I'm pretty that I, that I feel fairly certain that 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 not all of the money that could be used will, will be used, but I think a lot of it will be. Yeah. I don't think I don't think all of it will come down either. So I think overall education spending will go up. It's my guess. Uh, I had missed that part of your comment, and I'm dead oh. right. Yeah. And I'm sorry, Rep. Townsend, you had your hand up a while ago. That's okay. Uh, thanks. Just a, a simplistic kind of question. Throughout your presentation, you've mentioned a few times the researchers. I don't recall, are these researchers people that are uh, in-house to Vermont state government or were they contracted out? They were, they were contracted out. They're, they're academics and, and this is their field, education finance. It's Professor Tammy Colby at UVM, Bruce Baker from, from Rutland, I believe, uh, at Rutgers, um, Drew Atchison and, and uh, Jesse Levine from the American Institute of Research. They, they all work together on this. I, thank you. I believe in the 22 budget, we, pro, we created this work group and provided yeah. funding to, or maybe it was in 20. It was an early one. Well, it was based on a study of a couple of years before well, that, yeah. right? Oh, and that's right. Yeah, it came, it came out of Act 173, which was 2017 or 18, I can't remember. Oh, okay. Was. okay, time has no meaning. It has no meaning. Reminds me. Yeah, I think I need to go to house. Oh, you are definitely safe. Uh, so thank you very much. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. And, I, and again, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions. I don't expect you to remember once. Yeah. Well, like I said, next time. <laughs> I wish you had been a live teacher. But, 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 but um, <laughs> Mr. James, I do want to ask you really quickly while you're walking out. Remind us about what the Medicaid money is. That oh, thank you. Yes. Um, the Medicaid money, um, I have an email somewhere <laughs> that I sent to, to Maria. Um, the, medic, the Medicaid money is, is, comes from, from when, when supervisory unions are looking at their kids, they're, they're identifying as many as they can, who, kids who are Medi Medica Medicaid eligible. Okay? And then they reimburse for that. The money, they, they send in reimbursements to that to the federal government. The money comes to us, AOE, into a special fund that was set up, it's in, it's in statute, into a special fund. And then we give each SU 50% of what they, they generated and their reimbursements. Okay, this is what we do. If there's over a certain amount, we give 
we do we take over 25,000. Oh, I forgot to put that number in. It, it inflates and it's much higher than 25 million at the moment. Um, if there's money over that amount, then we we take we take 25 percent of that quote unquote excess, and it becomes an incentive grant to districts to SUs that have more than 80 percent uh, eligible uh, rate. So that's additional money to them. And then we can keep, we being AOE and AHS, we work with AHS on this, can keep up, up to, I don't know what percent we keep, but we keep up to 30% of the, of the reimbursement for administrative costs. I'd be surprised if we use that much, but we might for all I know. Um, and then anything left over is what goes into the Ed Fund, that you're just seeing at the Ed Fund line. I think it's roughly 10 million. Interesting. That's, I, I didn't know that either, so I was glad you asked the question. <laughs> but it's in, it's in statute, is, is where I found it before I tried to find something. All, all our people who knew that were gone, they left. <laughs> That's a problem. Yeah, it was. Um, you need to go. I bet we'll have a, you've now asked, made me think of a lot of different questions, but go, go. I, yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to answer any and questions. We'll, yeah that out because okay. none of that makes sense. I think, I think Maria, you have, you have that email, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you're you very much. You're very welcome. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah, you're, it is fun. I can tell you like it. Thank you. Uh, Bob. So we're still live. Yeah. Are we live? Yes, we are live. Um, so we, th this is Thank you guys. And once again, we've run over. When we have all of this time, we fill it. Um, we are done for the day. We're on the floor at three. We have nothing before. We have nothing in here until one o'clock when we're hearing about nursing homes. So it is Dave who is the reason we are here. And oh boy. <laughs> no. I feel I'm uh -oh. hanging me out to dry. Mary? Yeah, yeah, Robin. Do you have a sense of when Ways and Means is going to vote out the pupil waiting bill? No, they're working on it right now, and you may want to listen yeah. to it. And, and I think if we can, we'll try to get Julia back in because what Ways and Means is talking about is what she was not able to present to us the mm -hmm. cost factor adjustments. Right. That that would be great if we could get her in tomorrow or something. Yeah, scheduled for Tuesday at one o'clock. Yeah, okay. Tuesday. I, you know, my guess is they won't vote it out tomorrow. I'd be shocked. So, yeah. Okay. So, say hey, Mary. Yes. Uh, do you have a sense of what time we'll wrap up tomorrow? Uh, depending on how many questions you ask, Dave. Mm -hmm. well, I meant, you are the guy. Are you scheduling anybody for two o'clock? No. Okay. So, so that, that it, it, literally, it is just the nursing homes that won. I'm sorry, you're asking a fair question, and I, I, I can't imagine it'll be more than an hour. Understood. Yep. Thank you.